Okay, back to the Aristotle show, the politics. We're now, well, we still are in book one. We still are in chapter two. But now we're in part two, from households to the polis. In the previous video, I talked about the natural pairs, uh, how individuals get together in these natural pairs, about uh, men, women, creation, reproduction stuff, and the natural ruler and the naturally ruled and how Aristotle thought that you needed both of those natural pairs. Uh, you needed them, and logically it was necessary in order to eventually get a, a, a polis. Now, the polis, ultimately, in this chapter, it's kind of the ongoing, the story, the formation, and remember I said it was a, a, a logical analysis, not really a big historical one. And recall that in the distinctions earlier, you know, we had distinctions between uh, free men, women, and, of course, slaves. And Aristotle uses uh, some biology that I talked about, but uh, another thing that he uses quite a bit, which is interesting, and I think it shows just how much he is influenced by the, the ideas of his time, or some of them at least, or at least he thinks he's influenced. He could be getting it wrong. And what do I mean by that? Well, he uses a lot, probably more than in, in other sections of, the Nicom in, in sections of the Nicomachean Ethics, and probably a little bit more than other areas and sections of the politics, he uses uh, a lot of examples from poets. So you could say, oh, well, those were the ideas that uh, uh, were in the air of the time. That's what people was reading, were reading. Uh, they, these are the things that they were examining and digesting, uh, these ideas from the poets, and so Aristotle was just taking those. Well, that's probably true, but of course don't forget that uh, uh, Aristotle is quoting these uh, poets, but he might not be quoting them uh, correctly. That is, maybe the, the things that he thinks they're saying is not really what they're saying. So, as I mentioned in the previous video, this is a really thorny area. Uh, well, actually, all of Aristotle is controversial, really. There's tons of scholarship on all of it. But even some, in this case, some uh, scholars aren't convinced that Aristotle is using these poets correctly, and some, there's literature on how Aristotle gets the poets wrong. So maybe it's more biased than, than I've been saying or whatnot. So again, it's all pretty controversial. I'm trying to give a sort of a low temperature reading to it. But as you can see, it's, uh, uh, shall we say, it's pretty high temperature stuff when you start talking about distinctions and natural orders with human beings. All right, nonetheless, we continue. So in this video, I'm talking from households now these guys here, households, up to villages, and into the polis, and then a little bit on the polis and the individual. All right, so when you combine the natural pairs of male, female, and uh, the ruler, naturally ruled, or kind of the master-slave, if you like, you get a household. So that's what Aristotle thought a household really was. So a household... Basically, yeah, it's men, women, master, slave, and of course part of the men, women thing is reproduction, so children are, are here. Okay, so this, that's really a household. And remember, as I said, this is Aristotle's view of a household. So he's probably not thinking of the large-scale slavery that we uh, that would have been associated with the Spartans and the Helot state system of slavery of the time, or and of course Aristotle lived long before you know the the, the slave trade that that we often talk about you know with with North America and the British and all that stuff that led to the really large slave plantations and things like that. That's all after Aristotle's time, but there of course there was chattel slavery and all that. But Aristotle doesn't. Again, according to sort of the logic of his discussion, he's talking about households. So he's not talking about large-scale structures like, you know, where you would have big, big uh, uh, groups of slaves. It's, it seems to be that he's talking about, you know, just household slaves, like house slaves. I don't know what term you want to use for it, but it's in a smaller context. And we'll see that uh, uh, later on, 
in, in the next couple of chapters, Aristotle will unpack a little bit more and we'll get an idea of what he thinks a, house, uh, a household slave really is. Uh, and, uh, and, and so that might help clarify a little bit. But don't kid yourself, it's always the same thing, regardless in Aristotle's, what he, if he's talking about large or small scale, it's always the same thing. The notion of a human being can be property. That's clear. There's no, I, I don't think you can uh, uh, exempt, exempt that from Aristotle's discussion. Human beings can be property and naturally be property. That's an important element of Aristotle's uh, thinking here. All right, so the first form of association that uh, can satisfy daily needs, that's the family. Um, and so, uh, in, and this is not necessarily all of the needs, right? Because you don't achieve eudaimonia in, in these smaller, these are, remember, these are like little koinonia, little uh, small communities. You only get to eudaimonia in this community and not, of course, everyone gets to participate uh, fully in that community. So the, uh, the, the, the sort of the joy and the happiness that Aristotle is talking about here, the satisfaction of daily needs, this is basic needs and a little bit more. So a well-running household. So you can achieve some, you know, happiness and pleasure in this, but not fully, right? So that's the whole notion of building up these larger uh, communities. So, uh, uh, so not all the not all the needs of a, of a fully formed person, but basic daily needs, and you can live reasonably. There's a sense of living well within the uh, household that is the family. Well, when households start combining. So this is, again, this is largely from uh, uh, an idea that we saw with Solon and his view that, that really what's a village? What, it's really a collection of more or less independent households getting together. So you have a household with uh, uh, women and children and, 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 and slaves and the, the, the single, like a patri standard off the rock patriarchy where there's a man in charge. And in that sense... Uh, 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 since every household is already kind of like a little kingdom, so to speak, uh, the joining of households is uh, to place uh, them under some kind of leader, some sort of uh, a king, and Aristotle says that's ultimately how you get these kinds of monarchies. Uh, this is a development of community, uh, an, an, an extension of the notion of kononia, or a development of it, or a new version of it, however you want to put it, um, and this is the, uh, the village. It largely uh, looks after, again, more of the needs of the individuals. You can be a more complete human being in this context, but you cannot be complete. So you have larger, the larger the community, not just simply larger in the sense of uh, more individuals involved, but the more complex of a community, the more complex of a life you can live. So the logic is that we're getting increasingly complex, not just bigger, but more complex. So there's more things that you can do in this larger community, more ways you can express your humanity in this larger community, but you can't express, as Aristotle would say, your full humanity, that is to achieve eudaimonia, in the context of either a household or a village. But they're important. They're necessary, but not sufficient conditions for eudaimonia. All right, so again, daily needs are being looked after, maybe a little bit more here. Um, now, once we, uh, so there's households combine, and you get these villages. All right, so once the villages start uh, working together, eventually the city emerges, the police, right? So the villages, as they lead, to the, the police, again, keep in mind that it's not just simply larger. Aristotle wants to distinguish that, you know, you could have a very large family, that's not a village. You could have a very large village, and still not the complexity uh, of a polis. So it, there is not just size, but complexity is important too. Um, so in, in this sense now, uh, uh, as the several villages come together, the city emerges. This is a true koinonia. That is true as in complete, perfect, can't add to it. If you do anything, you make it less 
uh, you degrade it, right? So once something is perfect, like a perfect pizza, you add another ingredient, you ruin it, you take an ingredient out, you ruin it. So perfect just really means independent and complete. So Aristotle thought that there was a natural unit of community. That's and, and a natural perfect unit. So these others, they're natural, but they're incomplete. So this is moving, shall we say, moving, and I put that not literally, but logically becoming, uh, moving towards completion. And of course, the notion of completion, when things are complete, they're not dependent on anything. So. It's becoming independent. So there were natural units of completion and independence, natural political units, right? Natural kononoi that we find we can achieve eudaimonia. Well, some of us do, not all. All right. So uh, and and so in this sense, um, this each of these right have a telos, right? So the the pairs, you know, uh, uh, men women getting together for the telos of producing children. Uh, ruler ruled for the telos of preservation. Households are there for the telos of meeting basic needs. So each has a telos, right? So they're all for the sake of something. They're all moving towards something. So they're all moving towards uh, a, a completion, a larger, more encompassing, bigger, grandiose, more complex telos. So each of them, you can say, has a telos, and all of them fit into this larger one. So once you get the polis, that too has a, a, a T loss, right? And that has the highest T loss, if if you like. Um, that is uh, uh, to the, the 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 for the sake of achieving eudaimonia, this bigger and more complete uh, life where you can become fully human. Now, this is a complex enough structure, uh, uh, the polis that is, where you can truly be a person and live your life, right? And, uh, and, of course, if you're a free male in that sense. Okay, so every community is, exists for the sake of bringing this community into being, and this community exists for the sake of the individual. So it's kind of coming full circle. So in that sense, like individuals get together and create all these communities, and you work your way up, and then the final larger community exists so that the individual can achieve eudaimonia. So, and that's what... Uh, um, Aristotle talks a little bit polis and the individual. So he wants a nice, uh, shall we say, a nice ordering of how the individual isn't to be lost in this large thing. Aristotle still has a sense of, like he doesn't have any senses of human rights or anything like that, clearly, because he talks about ownership of people and things like that. Um, but he does have this desire to preserve the notion of the individual. And so in the state in the individual, towards the end, of, uh, uh, of chapter two, in book one, chapter two, uh, the city, it's the end, it's a natural and completed whole. It's a natural thing because, uh, as he says, man is a, a, a political animal, is one politicon. Um, and that one who, that, that the human being who's outside the city um, is kind of like a beast, um, but, or, or maybe the, 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 the rational creature that can live out the side of the city is uh, like a god. So outside of the polis, you don't really have real humans, right? Because it's only inside of the polis that you really become fully human. And again, as we've seen, not even everybody that physically lives inside the polis becomes fully uh, human. That's reserved for certain people. So the person who is by nature, shall we say, one that... Uh, uh, doesn't live, uh, I I achieve his true reality, is a creature maybe who has a natural desire for war. And Aristotle compares the person outside the polis to, uh, uh, depending on your translation, but like a, a, a figure or a, uh, or a piece in the game of backgammon. Um, now, it's hard to figure out exactly what he means by this, but you can think of it in, in this way, that the link between being outside and always being prepared for war. It uh, goes something, something like this. Here's, here's a way to think about it. Uh, if you think about a game like chess, we, in, in, in chess, you're always taught to protect your pieces. And what, what, what's a more concrete example? Your king, right? That's the piece you're always trying to protect. Uh, 
right? So you're always setting it up where your rooks and your queen and your, and your knights and all these other figures and the bishops and so on are protecting the king. But you also want to have it where any of your pieces, is, or, or all of, sorry, all of your pieces are protected. That is, if somebody, if your opponent wants to take any of your pieces, he or she will pay a price. So that's what we mean. So if you take my, even a pawn, you're at risk of my bishop, you know, getting you right afterwards. So if you, if you use uh, one of your pieces to take one of mine, my pieces are protected because I can swoop in with another one of my pieces. So what, what's this got to do with, with what Aristotle's saying? Well, it's inside of the polis that you live as protected. Right? You're within the walls of the city and you're protected. You can become a full human being because you are protected. Outside of the city, you're always in a state of war, right? You would always be worried, right? You would be in a state of insecurity. You would always have to be prepared to defend yourself. How often do we do that, right? Well, Aristotle would say if you're inside a protected system, you don't worry about it. If you're outside that system, that's when you have to worry, and you can't become fully human if you're always feeling threatened, so or insecure, or under attack. You're always in a state of, of war. And so that seems to be what Aristotle is getting at with this sort of imagery that he uh, uh, talks about that relates somehow to backgammon in some of the translations. Um, and he refers to Homer for this. And it seems to be a little bit different than what Homer is saying, but I think Aristotle is, again, to be read on that chess analogy. Uh, now Aristotle notes that, look, we're not the only creatures that live in communities. We're not the only, shall we say, uh, uh, zuan politicon, right? Uh, uh, we can look at, and he did, he observed lots of creatures. He observed bees and, and cows and all kinds of things and said, yeah, they're, they're social animals a lot like us. Right? They, they do live in communities, and they seem to benefit from their communities. Um, but one of the things that's different, now, of course, Aristotle didn't have all of our sophisticated uh, observations of uh, animal psychology. Right? We now know that bees do communicate, you know, their little waggle dance. A bee comes in and will communicate to her, to her fellow workers where the flowers are that she found or whatnot. Aristotle didn't know this, but he knew that they, they cooperated and they made honey and he would have been aware of, of the, the benefits that bees got from their social life, so their little bee conoia, if you like. Um, but he didn't really think that animals could communicate the way we can. That is, he thought they could communicate, um, that uh, they could basically communicate uh, pains and pleasures to each other, so that, they, so that animals could be aware if another animal was in pain. So he thought they had a very rudimentary form of signaling or communication to each other. So they weren't isolated from each other totally. But they weren't connected on the deep ways that humans can connect. They don't have the complexity of a, of a, of a kanoya that, that is like a polis or even uh, on the level of the family and the household. Why? Because they don't have speech. They don't have the full-blown speech that we have. They can't talk to each other and relate in this complicated way that, that we can. We can know good, we can know bad, we can be aware of these things, and we can talk about them. Um, and so we are, shall we say, uh, maybe not radically different in our socializing, although problem, you know, we certainly have rationality, which definitely in Aristotle's, of course, in Aristotle's view, we alone have this rationality. So we are, you know, maybe radically different if you like, but we are incredibly more complex than uh, other kinds of, of animals. And uh, this coming together where we can discuss and, and partake in philosophical conversations about politics and the good and all these things that you see in Plato's dialogues, those only take place in a city. After all, somebody's got, as if you read uh, all of Plato's dialogues, you know, all the people are sitting around, they're pretty well always men, and they're sitting around and they're drinking wine and eating figs, and someone has to clean up the place. So this is sort of the underpinning is you, you need cer certain people to do certain things so that other people can uh, talk about philosophy. All right, so overall, Aristotle says that the, the community is prior to its parts. 
That seems to be reversing the whole order of things. But the city is um, logically prior, Aristotle says. So in the tradition of, of uh, political philosophy, you will see philosophers talking about logical priority as different from temporal priority. Well, that's a bit of a mess to unpack that. I'm not going to get into all details uh, of it. But a city is like logically prior because you really don't have the concept of a household unless they're in a city. Right? So a real household is only a real household in the context of a city. A real village, a real individual is only really an individual in the context of a city. Uh, <coughs> like excuse me, like uh, Aristotle says, the notion of a, of a hand really can only be a hand when it's connected to a larger organic structure, like a body. If, you, uh, if my hand weren't attached to my body, it's not really a hand anymore. It's, we would still you'd say, oh, there's a hand, but we'd say it's a severed hand, and it's not truly a hand in the same way that this is a hand. Or we might say that it's a hand in the way that uh, a statue has a hand on it. So in that sense, uh, uh, an individual severed from the city, you know, that's been... Uh, uh, that's been uh, ostracized or whatever, and the Greeks did every once in a while vote people out of the city. Uh, they, that's sort of an odd quirk of their, uh, of their democracy. They could, you know, exclude people. And then you're not really a person anymore when you're excluded from the city. All right, Aristotle, as I mentioned earlier, thinks we have natural desires. We have natural desires, again, to leave copies of ourselves. So that's not just a choice. Like, we don't just make choices about, uh, 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 about leaving copies. That's a natural thing to do, according to Aristotle and his biology. Also, there are other natural sorts of desires. We naturally want to uh, 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 live and uh, be, we have a natural impulse to want to live in cities, in these larger communities. We naturally desire those structures that complete us. Right? Sometimes we hear about, you know, we, we desire a certain kind of partner that will complete us. Well, that's an old Greek notion, too, is that humans are always looking for that which will complete them. Same thing in, 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 in animals and plants. They're desiring things around them that will complete them. Right? Plants desire, the, uh, desire earth and sunlight because that will enable them to complete themselves and to complete themselves and bear fruit, that is, to make copies of themselves. So we, uh, we naturally desire the city. This is a natural thing. We want to live in them. And, that, and, and of course, because we're just naturally hooked up that way to want it. Now, Aristotle says that when things go wrong and you don't, when humans don't live in cities, Right? When, when humans are outside, remember I talked earlier about you're either a god or kind of a barbarian. And Aristotle said man is one of the best creatures. So when we hear about Greeks you know, praising human beings above all measure, it's in a context that they did that. Aristotle is very clear that human beings at their best in a city, flourishing, achieving eudaimonia, at their best, that is one of the finest things that you can think of. Uh, that is the finest, uh, one of the heights of uh, reality is, is this human living, this kind of eudaimonia, this life of eudaimonia. But as we are uh, capable of ascending to the heights, when we're outside of that which completes us, when the individual, when the individual is outside the polis, excluded from it, isn't with others, that is the worst thing in, in, in reality. So um, a man outside the city, separated from law. Remember back in the Nicomachean Ethics, uh, law was a big thing in uh, Book 5, uh, law and justice. Man separated from law, justice, the, the community, the koinonia, the, the polis, is the worst of all creatures. The, the, the nastiest, the, because we have this rationality that can go so wrong if it's not trained properly. Injustice enforced, right, because humans start enforcing injustice, and we have the power and the rationality to do that. So this is um, naturally part of us as well. You know, we're naturally born to be either virtuous or vice-ridden. We have to, as Aristotle said, habituated 
to become morally virtuous and we have to be taught the intellectual virtues. And if that's not there, and you get a, a human that's sort of raised in the wild outside of the police, you get one of the nastiest, worst critters possible. So we have to be raised in the city, raised right, and so this all has to fit together in order to have a, a proper individual. It has to be in the polis and the polis done right. But this is not an artificial construction. It is something natural. So it's an aberration or, or, or a deflection or what, a deviance from natural type when things aren't set up properly. Because how, when they're set up properly, that's a natural uh, that's a natural occurring entity. So it's natural to, uh, for certain humans to become true individuals in the context of a polis. Justice belongs to the city, and that, finally, the polis, that is the place for man. Stay tuned.